Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One Minute Apologist. We interview the world's leading apologists to provide credible answers to curious questions. When do we have enough evidence to know then that Christianity is true? I think that uh, the standard we use in a courtroom is a very high standard. Mm -hmm. We have four different levels of, of standard of proof, SOP, in the state of California, for example. And the highest level of proof offer is really what we use in criminal trials with homicides. It's the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. You'll notice it's not beyond a possible doubt. And we ask jurors, are you the kind of person who has to have every question answered before you can make a decision? Are you able to make a decision if there are some open questions that haven't been answered? Do you have to know every possibility? Does it have to be every possible? And if they're that kind of a person, we simply won't have them on our jury. And it's not just us, it's the defense who feels the same way. We have to have people understand what is reasonable and what is possible, the difference. And we ask people to, when they get into thinking about these issues in the jury room, if you have doubts, put them on the wall. Write them on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then assess them and ask yourself, are these doubts really more about my emotional response to the evidence or my volitional response? Mm -hmm. Or are they really reasonable in light of the evidence that's been presented to you? Because there's a difference between reasonable doubt and possible doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just did a case that was on Dateline in March in which I had a, mur a murder victim who was murdered 30 years ago and her husband hit her body and her family never knew what happened to her. He said that she ran off. And so for 30 years, they believed that she just ran away. When we got to trial, I had no body. I had no idea how he killed her, where he killed her, what he did with her body, how he moved her car to make it look like she had run off. We convicted him in four and a half hours. And even when we convicted him, no one was happy. The victim's family didn't want to believe their daughter was even dead. And the suspect's family certainly didn't think he could do that. He confessed about a month later to the entire thing. So we know he did it now. And we were able to, to prosecute it even though we had unanswered questions, significant unanswered questions. So that I think that this level of, of, of proof, the reasonable doubt standard, if we think it's valuable enough to determine the fate of a suspect, whether he's going to be executed, whether he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail, it ought to be the same kind of standard we can use to determine our eternal fate. And so if we apply the same reasoning to the, to the Gospels, I think we're going to find that most of the doubts we have are not as well evidentially supported as the claims themselves. So they really fall in the category of possible doubts, but they're not reasonable doubts supported by the evidence. And when we see that, we're able to make a decision that is beyond a reasonable doubt because we're not camping on the possibilities. Yeah, it's like Christianity closes the doubt gap the best compared to any other worldview because it does have the best evidences, but there's still some areas in there where we'll have some questions that we just can't answer. Absolutely. No matter what you believe, you can't answer everything. That's right. Every <laughs> worldview has its own set of unanswered questions. I do think you're right that our view has the least unanswered questions. Closes the doubt gap. Thanks, Jim.